Good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm Chief Executive of the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this very special event, the 2016 Albert Medal Presentation and Lecture. Uh, before we begin, can you please switch your phone to silent? We're filming this evening's event and streaming live over the RSA website, so welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And a reminder that the hashtag is RSA Tatchell if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to members of the RSA's LGBT network attending this evening's event. Now, housekeeping notes is over. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's celebratory event. The RSA has awarded the Albert Medal for Innovation in the Fields of Creativity and Social Improvement since 1864. We've put the emphasis in recent years on social innovation and change. And recent past recipients include the visionary business leader James Timpson and the healthcare innovator Joster Block. The Albert Medal is now recognised as a means of identifying and rewarding those at the forefront of practical social innovation, those sometimes unsung heroes who are driven by a desire to make the world a better place. Tonight's Albert Medal winner is uh, Peter Tatchell, and he is just such a person. Peter has been campaigning since 1967 on issues of human rights, democracy, civil liberties, LGBT equality and social justice. He is director of the Peter Tatchell Foundation, which seeks to raise awareness, understanding, protection and implementation of human rights in the UK and worldwide. Peter, we're delighted you've joined us here at the RSA this evening to accept the Albert Medal and to share the principles that have guided your campaigning career. We're looking forward to hearing more about your LGBT advocacy and activism and what this has taught you about achieving transformation in, a, in society um, especially as we look out on particularly troubled and challenging times. So, Peter, please join me at the lectern. It gives me great pleasure. It gives me great pleasure, Peter Satchel, to award you the 2016 RSA Albert Medal. Thank you. Show it. And with that, we are also awarding you Life Fellowship of the RSA. So thank you. Can you, can you open it? Oh, it, open it, right. To show it to everybody. Okay, very good. <laughs> Is it in this box? Yes. Very good. There we are. How's that? It should be you that's holding it. Pleasure. Very good. Over thank to you, you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matthew, for that very warm introduction. It is my great honour, my immense honour, to accept the Albert Medal 2016. All the more so given the many world-renowned previous winners. Um, I feel so unworthy compared to their awesome global achievements. I would like to dedicate my acceptance of the Albert Medal 2016 to South All Black Sisters who have for 37 years defended black and ethnic minority women against forced marriage, domestic violence, marital rape, honor killing, slavery, trafficking, female genital mutilation, patriarchy and religious fundamentalism. These women are heroines of human rights, inspiring role models of courageous feminism and humanitarianism. I salute them. Please join me in expressing your admiration and appreciation to Southall Black Sisters. Turning to my own life of agitating, educating and organising, uh, it has been my great privilege to have been a small part of many diverse human rights and social justice campaigns over the last 50 years, including struggles for civil liberties, free speech and women's equality, as well as activism against imperialism, 
war, apartheid, and global poverty. But I'm best known for championing lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights from the margins to the mainstream. Looking back on my half a century of human rights work, it seems so unreal, so implausible. After all, nothing in my family background inclined or prepared me for a lifetime of campaigning. I was born in Melbourne, Australia in 1952. Growing up in a period of illiberal government and anti-communist witch hunts. My parents were conservative, working class, evangelical Christians. Very similar to those depicted by Jeanette Winterson in her book, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. On the positive side, they taught me to stand up for what is right and to not follow the crowd. A maxim that I took to heart, although not in the religious way that they intended it. I had to leave school at 16 to get a job to help ease my family's financial burdens. The following year, 1969, I realized I was gay. This was at a time when, in the state of Victoria, homosexuality was a serious criminal offense, punishable by several years imprisonment and, sometimes, by psychiatric treatment. Back then, there were no LGBT organizations or helplines in Melbourne, nothing. But hearing about a gay rights march in New York in late 1969, I decided that I wanted to start a campaign to push for the decriminalization of homosexuality and for laws to protect LGBT people against discrimination. My few gay friends were too scared. They feared arrest. I was alone. I had no support or mentors. So to get ideas about how to campaign for LGBT equality, I studied the history of past social movements, including the Chartists, suffragettes, Gandhi's Indian independence struggle, and in particular, the black civil rights movement in the United States. Reports of which I saw almost nightly on TV news bulletins during my teens in the 1960s. I aspired to adapt their values and methods to my contemporary goal of LGBT human rights. This idea of listening to and learning from other social movements has stayed with me ever since and has been central to many of my subsequent campaign successes. At the age of 17, in 1969, I came up with the idea that LGBT people were an oppressed minority, just like black people, and that we, like them, also had a claim for equal rights. Studying how long it took African Americans to overturn racially discriminatory laws, I calculated it would take about 50 years to win LGBT equality in Western countries like the US, Australia, and Britain. I was in it for the long haul, having read about the delays and setbacks the black civil rights movement had often suffered en route to winning equal rights. It was not until I came to London in 1971, at the age of 19, and joined the newly formed Gay Liberation Front, that I was able to put my campaign ideas into action with others. The Homosexual Law Reform of 1967 in England and Wales 
was a partial, limited decriminalization. Arrests of gay and bisexual men rocketed by nearly 400% in the years that followed. And all the anti-gay laws remained on the statute books. Clearly, many more reforms were needed to be won. In those days, the battle for LGBT human rights was marginalised. There were no openly gay public figures. No political party supported LGBT equality. All across the board, we were non-people. Gay people did not exist in law and had no legal rights or protections. Arrests and gay bashing attacks were normal. There were very few of us who were out and even fewer who were demanding equality. It seemed, back then, an almost impossible task. We were striving to overturn the homophobia of centuries and millennia. Our goal was nothing less than revolutionary. A peaceful, cultural revolution in values, laws and institutions. Undeterred by the obstacles, I held fast to a vision of what one day could and would be. Given that Parliament refused to even discuss LGBT equal rights, winning law reform was out of the question in the early 1970s. I argued that the Gay Liberation Front should instead target potentially more easily reformable institutions such as the media, church, police, medical profession and service providers. Some of our first protests were against pubs and cafes that refused to serve LGBTs. Borrowing directly from the tactics of the African-American civil rights movement, we staged a series of sit-ins which soon resulted in the gay bans being lifted. There were also guerrilla-style hit-and-run protests against homophobic psychiatrists, clergy and publishers. These same non-violent direct action tactics were applied a generation later, from 1990, in my work with the LGBT campaign group Outrage. Faced with continued homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic intransigence, <coughs> neglect and rejection by Parliament, we had no choice but to use those methods. I worked out very early on that protest is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end, to raise public awareness about an issue, to inspire others to join in, and to pressure the authorities to make concessions. Unlike many other campaigners, I also reasoned that a successful campaign needs to engage in parliamentary and extra-parliamentary action. The suffragettes and the suffragists showed that you need both. Protest outside of Parliament to demand reform, followed by legislation inside Parliament to make that reform law. Like the women's suffrage campaign, I've had my feet in both camps. Inside the political system and outside it. Pursuing whichever method was likely to be most effective at the time. So I pursued a twin-track approach. I organised protest campaigns, but I also sought and won selection as a Labour candidate in 1981. As many of you may recall, I was then banned by the Labour leadership for over a year, 
because I had urged extra parliamentary action against the Thatcher government. Eventually, though, I was endorsed as the official Labour candidate, but went on to lose the Bermondsey by-election in 1983. Arguably one of the dirtiest, most violent and homophobic elections in Britain in the 20th century. But I decided to turn the negative into a positive by using my newfound public profile to champion LGBT equality and other human rights issues. When the police were witch hunting the LGBT community in 1989-1990, with a huge spike in arrests, I tried dialogue and negotiation with New Scotland Yard. It didn't work. So my co outraged colleagues and I resorted to direct action, including invading and occupying police stations in tandem with getting media coverage of the persecution of LGBTs for consenting same-sex behavior, including the often harrowing personal stories of LGBT people who had been subjected to police victimization. These tactics embarrassed the police and we won the PR battle. Officers pleaded with us to come back to the negotiating table. But they saw us as a one-dimensional protest group and still hoped to palm us off with a couple of minor concessions. I knew that we had to do more than protest to win change. We needed to offer constructive, achievable alternatives. With others, I drafted a nine-point action plan with specific, concrete, practical policies to secure non-homophobic policing. It was well-researched based on LGBT-friendly police policies in cities like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, plus a few ideas of our own. Most of the public thought our action plan, which we publicised widely, was reasonable. The police were outmanoeuvred, and within a year had agreed to most of our demands. Within three years, the number of gay and bisexual men convicted of consenting adult same-sex behaviour fell by two-thirds, the biggest, fastest fall ever. Direct action worked where negotiations had failed. We saved thousands of men from criminal convictions, fines and imprisonment and from the frequent knock-on effects of losing their jobs, homes, families and marriages, which often led to depression, breakdowns, alcoholism and attempted suicide. In the early 1990s, Outrage was doing a direct action protest every two to three weeks, securing masses of media coverage. This was a very carefully worked out strategy. Our thinking was twofold. First, the publicity about our protests hugely increased public awareness of the scale of anti-LGBT discrimination and violence. Second, it helped normalize LGBT visibility and demands. Some people in the wider public were initially shocked and even disgusted by our protests and the issues that we raised. But after the 20th plus such protest, the level of shock and disgust waned. And some early critics began to listen to what we had to say. During this period, I was the main front man for outrage. It made me a magnet 
for homophobic abuse, death threats, and violent assaults, often from organized far-right gangs. In that period, I lived with the real fear of being killed. There were dozens of attacks on my flat, including arson attempts and bricks through the windows. I was beaten up on the street dozens of times, leaving nearly all my teeth chipped and cracked. It was like living through a low-level civil war. Plus, I was on a kill list drawn up by the neo-Nazi terrorists Combat 18. This forced me to rebuild my flat as a fortress with bars on the windows, a steel reinforced front door and fire extinguishers in every room. As well as stress induced migraines and hallucinations, I had frequent night terrors and was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. These constant threats and assaults were devastating. They left me physically ill and emotionally shaken. I was periodically on the precipice of a mental breakdown, struggling to maintain my sanity. But somehow, my survival instinct and idealism kept me going. Despite flashes of despair, I remained determined to carry on and to not let the bigots win. What helped me cope with was the knowledge that human rights defenders in Iran, Russia, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia suffer far worse fates. I wasn't jailed, I wasn't tortured, I wasn't killed. I was also buoyed by the camaraderie and solidarity within outrage. It was a great antidote to the hate campaign that was directed against me. A hate campaign that was often fueled by the red top tabloid press, which variously branded me, and I quote, a homosexual terrorist, gay fascist, and public enemy number one. A backhanded compliment, I thought. My activism and outrage rethought the way of doing protest. In contrast to the traditional march from Hyde Park to Trafalgar Square, which was boring and had been done to death, we strove to be imaginative and innovative with mass kiss-ins, queer weddings, carnival parades and street theatre. We also consciously rejected the angry, aggressive style of some left-wing protests which I think often tend to turn off the public. Our protests were designed to inform and educate and, wherever possible, to entertain. We often used humour and theatricality as a way of breaking through hostility. Our thinking was, if we can make a critic laugh, that's the first step to subverting their homophobia. Some of the tactics outrage used, such as outing hypocrites and homophobes, were provocative. They were controversial. We knew they would alienate some people, even some LGBT people as well, in the short term. But we were convinced that they'd have the all-important long-term effect of deterring public figures from abusing their power and influence <coughs> to harm the LGBT community. So it turned out, after we named Ten Lincoln Bishops in 1994, as far as I know, none of them ever said or did anything anti-LGBT. Unlike other organizations that one-sidedly concentrated on law reform, Outrage backed legal changes and also sought to change public opinion. 
I reasoned that it would only be half a success if we won equal laws while anti-LGBT attitudes still prevailed. Such attitudes would leave LGBT people vulnerable to ostracism, prejudice, discrimination, and hate crime. We needed a dual approach. The cumulative effect of our constant direct action protests achieved what we planned. It slowly and surely transformed hearts and minds. By the mid-1990s, we won majority public support for the equalization of the gay age of consent and an end to the ban on LGBTs in the armed forces. We were then able to go to MPs with the evidence of popular backing, which helped embolden them to bring forward legislation to reform. Looking back over my half century of campaigning, LGBT people and causes have gone from the margin to the mainstream. And it hasn't just been down to me, it's been down to me and many, many, many others, most of whom are unknown and unsung, but who played an equally important role. So let's look where we are today, half a century later. Anti-gay laws have been abolished and new legal protections enshrined in law. Public acceptance has burgeoned and homophobia dissipated. LGBT visibility is the norm. Homophobia, not homosexuality, is deemed a social problem. Britain is moving towards becoming a post-homophobic society. I am so lucky to have been part of this momentous, historic, peaceful revolution. Working alongside tens of thousands of other LGBT people and our straight friends and allies. There are, of course, still unfinished issues like homophobic bullying and hate crime and the frequent refusal of asylum to LGBT refugees fleeing persecution. To complete the goal of LGBT acceptance and rights, the maxim that has guided me these last 50 years remains just as relevant and necessary today. Don't accept the world as it is. Dream of what the world could be and then help make it happen. Thank you. that was incredibly powerful and confirmed all the reasons that we wanted to give this award to you. Um, just while you're kind of uh, getting over the speech, and before we take some questions, I, I told you I wouldn't do this, but I am going to do it, which is when you mentioned the Bermondsey by-election, I think one of the first times I ever talked about you was my father wrote an article for the New Statesman, and he followed you around in that by-election campaign, which, as you say, was absolutely hideous. And there was this moment... Uh, he tells me that you were on the top floor of a council block and an elderly lady answered the door, and the door on the chain. And you said, you know, I'm your Labour candidate, will you be voting for me? And she said, I'm not sure, dear, I'm really not sure. And you said, which is absolutely true, you said, well, you know, you, you should really vote for me because I'm a local person, I just live over there. And you pointed to your flat across the way. And she turned to you and she said, oh, dear, she said, no, I wouldn't vote for anyone from round here. Uh, <laughs> um, just two or three questions for me before we open it up. Uh, one of the things you didn't talk about in the speech, and this is not criticism because you covered 50 years in, in, in 25 minutes, but you didn't talk about HIV AIDS. And it seems to me, looking back over that period, that that was a really important moment of inflection. I remember when that started, there was a lot of very 
uh, terrible language phrases like gay plague being thrown around, a lot of fear. And it felt to me from the outside that, that gay people made a decision at that point, whether or not it was a kind of conscious decision or tacit or whatever, which was there was a choice between retreating and hiding or, to use that phrase, coming out and being proud and starting what was a really powerful public health movement, actually, around education, which you were part of, I think, and about demanding better medical treatment and social treatment. I'm just interested in your recollection of that, of that moment. Well, you're right. There's uh, quite a few key moments that I, unfortunately, was not able to cover in the limited time. Um, but it is very true that the AIDS uh, pandemic was both a horror and a tragedy, but also an opportunity which did open many doors. So for the first time ever, uh, as a result of the um, fears around HIV, um, the government did sit down with LGBT community representatives to try and work out a strategy. They only did that, admittedly, after the first four years when they did nothing, but you know, they eventually, after four years, did sit down and it gave the LGBT community a place at the table that we'd never, ever had before. And that was driven primarily by the health emergency. But I think a lot of us also saw this as a way in to undermine the closed doors that had been traditionally uh, confronting us. And it did mean that um, for the first time there was an open public discussion about LGBT issues including from the words and mouths of government ministers. So that was, that was a big, significant moment. One of the downsides was that a lot of LGBT activists went into HIV work, so the movement for equality somewhat took second place. Uh, I think there was a, a, a period of setback there. But ultimately, it probably worked for the good. Um, you talked about the successes in, in Britain, I want to come back to those in a, in a minute, but a, another thing which you glossed over uh, in your speech is the work, the incredibly brave work that you've done internationally. I know it's very hard to do, but give us a sense of where, that, where the international campaign is now, where the front lines are, where you think there is positive signs of change and where things look grim. Looking back to the Gay Liberation Front era, it was very much focused on the situation in Britain. But as an old-fashioned 1960s left-wing idealist, I had an internationalist vision. So I was constantly raising in the Gay Liberation Front, well, yes, we must fight these battles here, but what about Castro and Cuba interning thousands of gay and bisexual men in labour camps? We can't ignore that. We can't just close our eyes to what's happening in other countries. Or the Soviet Union jailing and putting LGBT people into psychiatric hospitals. Um, so I've always had this vision that the battle for LGBT freedom is a global one. You know, we are obviously fighting in our country for our particular immediate issues, but we mustn't close the mind, our mind to the reality that it is a global struggle. Now, these, these rights for LGBT people should be universal. You know, I don't just want them for people in Britain, I want them for people everywhere. So in that sense... Um, to Zimbabwe, Russia... Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the, the same principle applies to non-LGBT issues. You know, um, all the different campaigns I've done internationally over the years have been very much in response to appeals from activists in those countries for help and assistance to publicise what's going on and to um, you know, give, give support to their struggle. So, my two attempted citizens' arrest to President Mugabe of Zimbabwe were motivated by appeals from Zimbabwean human rights activists who said, look, you're very good at doing campaigns and raising issues. Can you do something to expose what's happening under the Mugabe regime? And in the 1990s, this was, what was happening was not well known in the outside world. So I thought it was actually quite important that I try and do something. And initially, I just did some protests outside the, what was then the Zimbabwe High Commission on the Strand, um, now the Zimbabwean Embassy, um, and they made an impact, but not much. So then I hit on the idea of using the power of citizens' arrest to try and bring Mugabe to justice using British and international anti-torture laws. 
So it, it's always been an internationalism that's been driven by a sense of solidarity is important. If we were suffering like they were suffering, we'd want someone to help us. So we should reciprocate. And I don't want to embarrass you, Peter, but um, David Aronovich told me many years ago about you taking a trip with him and a whole lot of other people, the Socialist International, I think, to, to East Germany in the early 70s. Can you imagine this? And uh, the, the left-wing British students were all keeping rather quiet about civil rights issues. And to their horror, in the square, with Eric Honecker there, I think, you unveiled a banner saying that Germany should remember the LG, the loads of gay people who had been killed at Auschwitz and other places. I mean, mm. and you got beaten up the first of many times. Mm. Well, not the first of many times, mm. but one of many times. I mean, it's quite an amazing thing to have done. And you've been carried on doing that. Mm. Since, and you, have, have you stopped? I mean, you've, you know, you're of a certain age now where you might feel that gallivanting around the world and getting beaten up everywhere is for younger people. I don't want to be ageist. <laughs> Well, I'm under doctor's orders, no more brain and eye injuries. Because I've got some minor That's brain. That's something you can shout out when people are coming towards <laughs> you. <laughs> um, but going back to that, that, that um, event, the World Festival of Youth and Students in what was then communist East Berlin in 1973, um, a friend of mine in the Gay Liberation Front, John Lloyd, was a member of the Young Communist League. And he was going to this festival and he said, look, um, why don't you come too? And I, I didn't know anything about it. And then he said, well, 150,000 students all over the world are going to be there. I thought, wow, this is a great opportunity to take LGBT issues behind what we then called the Iron Curtain. You know, we could break through the censorship and oppression of the pro-communist regimes, which are intensely homophobic. So, yeah, I went there with the determination, the, this, 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 this sheer bloody-minded idealism of that, uh, well, I've got a British passport, or in those days an Australian passport. Um, that, that'll, uh, most of what happens is, is a few months in prison, maybe. That'll, oh, I can deal with that. <laughs> um, but it did make a huge impact. And I, I smuggled in thousands of leaflets and pamphlets about LGBT issues, which uh, were given out to Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, Romanians, Russians. Um, we have probably never seen well, any kind of ab absolutely, literature like that. Absolutely. And... Years later, <laughs> even just five years ago, I met someone in Germany who said one of those leaflets was still in circulation and now ended up in a museum in Germany. And uh, others told me about uh, the leaflets being circulated clandestinely in what was then the Soviet Union. Um, and you're right, these ideas had never ever been previously put out there because of the state censorship. So, to me, it was just the obvious thing to do. Final question for me before I open it up. So you helped, uh, you were part of a group that led uh, Outrage, which sounds like an angry organisation. Um, but yet, when I look at your Peter Tatchell top tips for successful social change, which I'm assuming is on your website, so I don't need to read them out. No, it's not. It's not? <laughs> okay, well, you... I just wrote them today. You just wrote them today, well... <laughs> Let me read out a couple of them, because I think they're really interesting. You say, lobby and persuade the doubters and opponents wherever possible. You say, listen to your critics, sometimes they might be right. You say, don't be negative and oppositionist. Offer positive, constructive alternatives. You say, produce imaginative, clever, witty, informative, entertaining campaigns. It, it's a wonderful kind of notion of how you can combine politics and principle but yet, at the moment, politics feels so angry. It feels so shrill. You know, it feels like a kind of fight to, for the moral high ground, where everybody is trying to say, I'm right, and that my tribe is right, and that other tribe is wrong. It, what's your kind of reflection on where modern politics is and how it is that progressives, you know, people in the room will have different political opinions, but it feels like the whole discourse is very shrill at the moment. And it lacks some of the kind of humanity and humour that you suggest in your principles. Yeah, to me... Um, the end goal is always to win over, quote, the enemy, not crush them. Um, I can remember um, in the early 1990s, um, outrage and myself harried Michael Patillo when he was Defence Secretary, when he was witch hunting LGBT people out of the armed forces. My friend Michael Patillo. Though. Your friend Michael Patillo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we gave him a very, very tough time. 
because, you know, he had, by his own admission, had a previous gay relationship, and regardless of that, he was persecuting LGBT people and ruining their careers, their lives. Um, some years later, when he was eventually re-elected to Parliament in the Kensington by-election, by he had a change of heart, and he began voting for equality. So I made the point of right to him, saying, thank you, Michael Patillo, for having a change of heart. Thank you for coming over to the side of equality. And I thought that was really important because, to me, we want, ultimately, our opponents to be our friends and allies. So persuasion, did you wherever write, possible. Did you write back? Oh, he, he did, and he, he personally thanked me. And he said, you know, he, he, we met in a TV studio some years later, and he said, it was one of the, wor the, the harassment we put him under, you know, challenging him over his witch hunting of gay people in the armed forces, was one of the worst periods of his political life. Um, but he said he was now really glad that he had been shown the right path. <laughs> Whether that was by me or outrage or by his own understanding and, and re-evaluation, it doesn't matter. The, port the important thing is he has since been an ally, and that's what really counts. Next time I'm on Merrill Mays with him, I'll, I'll say that he was cited as an example of the fact that anyone can be saved. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, so let's, oh my word, hands, two hands here. Uh, but we'll take one question at a time if we might. Um, yeah, so let's start. Thank you, Peter. You, you mentioned... If you could tell um, us your name, that would be great. Yeah, John Bailey. You mentioned early on um, about the appalling by-election to replace Bob Mellish. And I wondered whether you have any feelings about uh, revenge or any kinds of misgivings that lead you to think other than the way you presented this evening. And I wonder also whether you ever received any kind of... Um, I suppose, substantive uh, apology from papers like The Sun, who introduced terms like gay plague, which not only, uh, I suppose, angered you, but also misled us for many, many years in terms of what we were dealing with. And finally, what was your relationship with the Terence Higgins Trust? Thank you. <laughs> Three That's questions. <laughs> in terms of the tabloid press, um, I never had any apologies about the way they treated me or LGBT people in general. The closest that came was once Calvin McKenzie, who had been the editor of The Sun during that terrible period, did sort of express a half-hearted regret about some of the headlines and some of the stories that had been written. That was the closest. Um, in terms of the Terrence Singer Trust, I, I worked with them, but focused more on the human rights dimension. So in 1987, um, I helped draft the world's first human rights charter for people with HIV and AIDS. Um, I also helped organise the first ever international conference on HIV and AIDS, which was timed to coincide with the World Health Minister's Summit on AIDS in London in 1988. Um, so I was more focusing on the, the um, uh, I suppose, human rights side of things. And many of you will know I wrote a book called AIDS Guide to Survival in 1986, which was an attempt to present a counter-narrative to the idea that if you've got HIV or AIDS, you're going to die, just give up and curl up and die. Uh, it's trying to present, you know, practical ideas about things you could do to reduce the severity of uh, the symptoms and prolong your life chances. And what was the first question? Uh, the, the, have the wounds of the Bermondsey by-election healed, or did you, and did you ever become friends with Simon Hughes? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very forgiving person, so, you know, um, within, you know, less than a year after the Bermondsey by-election, I was working with Simon as my local MP. Your, he was your MP for decades, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah. Um, on HIV and AIDS issues, to, to raise them in Parliament. Um, on LGBT issues, on green issues, on a whole range of issues. Um, I've got to say that at the time, during, during the by-election, I'd been tipped off by people in the Liberals that he was gay and that I should out him because of the appalling campaign that the Liberals waged against me. But I took the decision that I wasn't prepared to stoop to those kind of tactics. He'd done the bad thing. I wasn't going to retaliate in that way. So I just stuck to the policies. And it was great that, you know, nearly 30 years later, he eventually did come out. Yeah. 
Ian Dodds. Uh, first of all, Peter, I'd like to say thank you as a member of the LGBT community for all that you have done for us. Um, however, my question is about uh, the future. I'm concerned about the disappearance of gay venues. Um, and I'm, I'm mostly know in London, but they're disappearing at quite a rapid rate. And I'm a qualified counselor and I counsel quite a lot of young gay men, and I know they often have enormous problems, like they've been rejected by their families, uh, like they ca ca can't even tell their families that they're gay, or even worse, they've been abused. And it seems to me that the gay venues that we've had have actually pr provided a place of refuge, if you like, a place of community uh, for gay people, and I think they played a very important part in the LGBT community's life over the last 20, 25, or 30 years. Thank you. Are we being a bit complacent? Yeah, well, there's, there's two issues here. One is gentrification of large parts of London is upping rents and land prices, so it's making not just LGBT venues, but all venues, social venues, more expensive, more difficult to maintain. So that's one issue. Uh, the second one is, of course, with the rise of social media and dating apps and so on, fewer people are going out. And therefore, the custom base to sustain a gay venue is diminishing. So there's a bit of economics both on both those counts. But you are right that, in many ways, Gay bars and clubs were, for the LGBT community, what churches were for African Americans during the civil rights struggle. They were the focus of um, social solidarity, meeting, and organizing. And I think back to the 1970s and 80s, and lots of gay bars and clubs did play a very important role in helping to distribute flyers and leaflets about campaigns, to fundraise for... LGBT campaigns, and that is certainly diminishing compared to 20, 30, or 40 years ago. I suppose on the positive side, I think I'm right that the decision to save the Royal Vauxhall Tavern was the first time a dis heritage decision has been made on the basis of a space's relevance to the history mm -hmm. um, of, the, uh, uh, of the community. Is that right? I think that's right. I think so. And there's a current campaign to save the glorious Victorian toilets at South End Green in Hampstead, uh, which were frequented by Joe Orton, um, but are now up for demolition. But you know, just on architectural grounds alone, these are resplendent. You know, Victoria Arna in, 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 its, in its most resplendent form, and I hope that will, they will be saved and put to some... It could be an art gallery, a restaurant, who knows, but that venue should also be saved. Yeah. Wait for the microphone to come. Here it is. Thank you very much for um, everything you shared. Um, I just wanted to ask um, almost a sort of details question. Can you almost. tell us your name? Sorry. Oh, sorry, Owen McCarthy. Um, I was um, wondering, do you have any tips or any strategies that you found particularly profitable in uh, empowering and mobilizing your constituency, as it were? How, do you, how did you get people to stand with you in the cold and in the rain and um, stand, put their bodies on the line in, in the way that you did? The answer? With the difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were, there were some protests which had thousands of people. There were others where all we could get was half a dozen. I can remember that the first attempt to arrest President Mugabe, I asked lots of human rights organizations, will you bring some people to come and help try to do a citizen's arrest? I've never heard so many plausible excuses. I'm going away for the weekend. My boyfriend, girlfriend's come to stay. I've just got a new job. I'm feeling fluey and, you know. Anyway, the upshot was I had to go back to outrage. And even then, out of the probably 100, 200 active people at that stage, only three. So there were four of us who did the attempt. Um, so, yeah, sometimes it has been quite difficult. But, of course... You know, I don't expect that everyone's going to entirely agree with my cause or my methods. 
So you have to accept that sometimes you will get lots of very uh, vocal and um, physical support, and other times not so much. But I think the important thing is, if you really sincerely believe in something, to stick at what you believe in. And I've often said to people who've turned up at protests when there's only been half a dozen, thank you so much for coming. You've made the effort. Others haven't, possibly for good reasons, but you've come here, you've taken a stand, and that's really important. It doesn't matter if there's only one person in the world who believes in LGBT rights. That person taking a stand is important. Uh, what do you, Sarah Wharton, what do you think are the key social movements of the future? The key social movements of the future? Don't get easy questions <laughs> the RSA. I think one issue that perhaps we're on the brink of um, experiencing is what I would call discrimination based on genetic inheritance. So if, for example, the human genome is eventually fully mapped in detail, um, there will be pressure, I'm sure, from insurance companies and others to uh, assess the genetic risk that individuals pose and probably pressure that people who have a, perhaps a genetic predisposition to alcoholism or drug use or what, something like that, that they may face new punitive premiums. Um, but also, you know, people who've got a predisposition to heart disease to various forms of cancer, uh, to, to kidney or liver failure, um, potentially mapping the human genome could throw up those kind of issues which could, I think, unfe unfairly penalise people just because of the genetic inheritance they have. Thank you very much, and congratulations again um, on, on your award. Um, I just had a question about what your view is on the current um, way to approach, or what you think the current struggles are for um, LGBT issues and, and, and fighting for them, given that the current age that we live in, perhaps more in this country than in others, but certainly on a, on a global level, as, as, you, uh, as your vision um, suggests, there are um, more, so many, I think, particularly yourself being one of them, um, LGBT um, role models and um, people in prominent positions who actually can, uh, are sort of out there for, for people to look up to, especially um, LGBT children as well. And there's a plethora of inf information on, on the internet, Twitter and social media. Uh, there's a lot more out there than, the, than there ever was. So what would you say the current struggles, um, particularly in relation to um, LGBT children who experience bullying um, on social media and some of whom actually commit suicide as well, when they do have um, role models that they could look up to. Can I ask you, Peter, just to add into that question, which is, is a final question as we're closing. I'm trying to find the right way to express this. There have been issues around the relationship between the LGBT community and BME communities over the past. You know, issues, for example, around um, young uh, black men and a, a sort of intolerance there, sometimes expressed in kind of musical, in for cultural forms. Now there's issues around the Islamic community because if one, the, the most common source of stories of extreme homophobia are aso associated, I guess, with Islamic fundamentalism. So tell us a bit about that story and where you think that lies. Well, just firstly, to pick up your point about um, you know, there are still young LGBT people who are depressed, suicidal, rejected by their families and so on. I've argued for three decades that sex and relationship education and equality and diversity lessons ought to be mandatory in every school. No opt-outs, no exclusions. And I think that's really important to tackle not just homophobia, biophobia, and transphobia, but to tackle racism, misogyny, prejudice against disabled people, and so on. And I can't understand why successive governments have been so reluctant to make sex and relationship education, inclusive of LGBT issues, compulsory in every school. Why it can't see the value of equality and diversity lessons in every school from the first year of primary level, because we know 
No young child is born prejudiced. They become prejudiced because of the negative influences of peers and adults around them. So if we can tackle that at a very early age, all the evidence from the schools where it's been trialed is that there's a massive de decrease in bullying and depression and hate crime. A, a huge expansion of understanding, acceptance and support across all the different diverse strands of equality and diversity. So it really angers me that governments won't take that quite simple and clearly very achievable and constructive agenda and make it practice in our schools. On the wider issue of, that you raised, I mean, I think we do need to remember that the LGBT communities are not all the same. Um, gay and bisexual men tend to have a greater visibility than lesbian and bisexual women. Uh, trans people tend to have a much lower recognition of visibility compared to the L, G and Bs. Um, we also know that you know, in the LGBT community, um, there are big differences depending on your income status. You know, well-off LGBT people have much greater options than those who are from poorer, low-income families. There's also disparity in terms of regions. You know, huge resources for LGBT communities in London and other big cities, but not so much in smaller towns and rural communities. Um, likewise, if you're from an ethnic or religious minority and you're LGBT, you're much less likely to be accepted by your family and community. You may face rejection, being thrown out of home, may even face um, physical and violent threats. So we need to recognize that we're not all in this together. There are differences, and we need to strive to make those differences disappear. We need to strive to uplift the particularly vulnerable members of the LGBT communities who are often marginalized within our communities as well as by the wider society. Um, in terms of the history, I mean, going back to the days of the Gay Liberation Front, in those days, the black and LGBT communities were very much side by side. Um, I can remember, it was 1971 or 72, when the black activists were on trial in the Mangrove Nine prosecution. The only non-black organization to stand in solidarity outside the court was the Gay Liberation Front, and we were mostly white. Um, when the gay communes were set up in Brixton, they were set up on Railton Road, on the front line, within the black community. And there was incredible solidarity. This is about a common struggle for black liberation, for gay liberation. Sadly, in the 80s and 90s, something went terribly wrong. And we had the rise of what we called, in outrage, murder music, where eight very well-known, high-profile Jamaican ragga and dancehall singers put out songs that openly and explicitly incited the murder of LGBT people. The shooting, burning, hanging, and drowning of LGBT people. And very interestingly, in Jamaica, where this music originated from, very quickly the mainstream Jamaican human rights organizations came on board to denounce this music and to also say, this music isn't just a threat to LGBT people, it's going to be a threat to all Jamaicans. Because once violence against one community is acceptable, then it eases the barriers to violence against others. And we made the same points here in Britain because, of course, black LGBT people were the main victims of this murder music. And there was a huge spike in this country in violent attacks upon LGBT people, particularly black LGBT people, when that murder music was at its height. And we went to black organizations and to black MPs to ask them to support the campaign. I've got to tell you, not a single one gave any public support. Not one. None of those black MPs, none of those black organizations spoke out against murder music. And that was a betrayal not of you know, LGBT people as a whole, although I suppose it was. It was a betrayal of black LGBT people who are on the sharp cutting edge of that kind of murder music. 
And I feel really angry to this day that all these well-known black MPs who now pride themselves about their support for LGBT rights, they weren't there when we really needed them, and more particularly when black LGBT people really needed them. Going over to the, the issue of Islamic fundamentalism. Briefly. Yeah, briefly. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right. Again, Muslim LGBT people are some of the most marginalized in our society. And there's not a single mainstream Muslim organization in this country that defends and supports the human rights of their own LGBT citizens. In fact, all the main organizations, the Muslim Council of Britain, the Muslim Association of Britain, and so on, they've all refused to speak out against the violence and hate that's being put upon LGBT members within their communities by their own community members. You know, we've tried to have a dialogue. We've approached places like the East Island Mosque to hold a joint meeting to discuss LGBT issues in a non-confrontational, you know, open way. The East London Mosque won't even consider it. They won't even reply to our emails. Um, you know, we're up against a brick wall. And our, my own Peter Tatchell Foundation organized from last year what we call an LGBT Muslim solidarity campaign under the theme of fight all hate. So we'll fight the EDL, the BNP, and all those far-right anti-Muslim groups, but we're also challenging homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia within the Muslim community, standing in solidarity with LGBT Muslims. And it was very interesting. We, we, we did a, a leafleting last October in Whitechapel, and um, the responses from Muslim people were very mixed. About 20% were supportive. They said things like, I'm Muslim, but I support gay rights. Another 20% were overtly hostile. They said really vile things. The other 60%, we couldn't gauge what their reaction was. They kept it very quiet. But that does show that there really is a lot of work to be done. And it's very, very hard and difficult because most LGBT organizations and most mainstream human rights organizations won't touch it with a barge pole because they're afraid of being accused of Islamophobia and racism. And that's what's happened to me. It happened to Outrage. It happens to my foundation now. Every time we strive to defend LGBT Muslims, we are denounced by people on the left and the right as being anti-Muslim or uh, endorsing um, you know, prejudice against Muslim people. And South All Black Sisters have had it their entire life, their entire 37 years of activism. They've been denounced for defending black and Asian women against patriarchy and religious fundamentalism, they've been denounced as anti-Muslim and you know, dismissed as being some far-right sort of secret lobby group. It's, it, it really does indicate the sad state of left and progressive politics when those who are striving <coughs> to defend the principle of universal human rights are scapegoated and vilified in this way. But like South Old Black Sisters, my foundation and a few others, we won't give up. We'll keep on fighting because we know that LGBT Muslims, LGBT African and Caribbean people have the same rights, the same dignity, the same respect as everyone else, and we're determined to do our bit to make it happen. Peter, thank you very much. Thank you all for your uh, questions. I think it's been a fantastic session. We're very proud to have given you this award, Peter. Um, if you want to join us to continue the conversation, then I think there's drinks downstairs in the uh, Benjamin Franklin room. It just remains for me to uh, ask you to join me in thanking the winner of the 2016 RSA Albert Medal, Peter Tatchell. Please take one of my little flyers on the way out. Uh, please sign up to Peter Tatchell Foundation. It's all free. It tells you how to do so on the back. And if any of you are feeling generous, please consider making a donation because we depend entirely on well wishers to continue our work. But thank you so much for coming. Solidarity onwards, upwards, and forward. <laughs>